Over the weekend, Twitter permanently suspended the personal account of Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene over the platform's COVID misinformation policy. A Twitter spokesperson told The Hill, quote, We've been clear that per our strike system for this policy, we will permanently suspend accounts for repeated violations of the policy. And while Green's congressional Twitter account remains intact, the suspension of her personal account has some wondering what platform she'll be on next, though early Sunday morning it appeared she took to Gitter and Telegram to air out her frustrations with the Twitter ban. Twitter's misinformation policy effectively prohibits criticism of, quote, official regulations and restrictions amid the, quote, emergence of persistent conspiracy theories and a wide range of false narratives, end quote. Team Rising is here to weigh in. Our colleague, The Hill's Julia Manchester and White House reporter for Real Clear Politics, Philip Wegman, join us to discuss. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Morning. And so, Julia, as a, uh, as a congressional reporter, as a political reporter, you know, what impact does it have on on your job, your ability to do your job, to have members of Congress not able to, uh, you know, kind of post to Twitter? Do you, are you gonna are you headed over to Getter and Telegram to find out, you know, what she's up to? You know, I think there will definitely be some reporters, including myself, that may tune into those accounts more once um, Marjorie Taylor Greene or maybe other lawmakers on those platforms, you know, are saying um, uh, things on those platforms will definitely be paying attention to it. But, you know, this was one of Marjorie Taylor Greene's accounts. She still does have another account on Twitter. So we'll be paying attention to both. But I think it's so interesting that this happened really basically a year after former President Trump was kicked off of Twitter and deplatformed from that website. So I think what you're going to see is, you know, figures like Marjorie Taylor Greene, D Donald Trump, um, potentially other lawmakers on the, you know, in the Trump wing of the party who may have issues with big tech really start to gravitate towards other platforms and, you know, explore other ways to communicate with their base. You know, this doesn't only affect me as a reporter, but I think it affects these bases. So it'll be interesting to see how much, um, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene's base gravitates towards those platforms in particular. Journalist Glenn Greenwald commented on Green's removal, saying that having unelected tech oligarchs ban members of Congress or even a sitting president from using their platforms is quite, is quote, dystopian. But progressive Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal expressed a different sentiment over Green's suspension, saying that Twitter didn't go far enough. Let's watch. Well, Jonathan, it's, uh, it's no secret that our social media companies have been part of their algorithms promoting disinformation. And um, I think that these steps are important, but frankly, a little too little and a little too late. Uh, the reality is it's not just Marjorie Taylor Greene, all over Twitter, social media, Facebook, uh, all of these companies have been using algorithms that are just about clickbait, not about truth. Yeah, so she's highlighting there the central issue for tech companies, for tech moderators, which is that who are, you know, facing possibly, potentially at least, regulation, bipartisan regulation. And you have Republicans complaining that they moderate, they censor, whatever you want to call it, way too much content. And the, the an equally powerful other side, the Democrats, furious that they that they don't more aggressively moderate or censor content. I mean, who like who who's going? So to Twitter, even if it just wants to make political figures happy, can't win because they're like diametrically opposed on what the company should do. So like, who who wins this battle? And this is why I think a lot of the alliances between the left and the right on tech reform, things like Section Two Hundred and Thirty, which is a painfully complicated. Um, issue. It's one that's more complicated than I think a lot of people uh, would like to make it. Uh, shows just how that they are approaching the issue from completely two separate sides. Um, and I, I doubt that there's going to be uh, actually room for some sort of bipartisan compromise. Uh, it is, I think, a, a little bit interesting uh, that you have Representative Jay Paul, uh, who is cheering a very powerful uh, tech monopoly uh, for uh, kicking off one of one of her rivals in Congress. I mean, that, that seems a, a little bit creepy, but here's the thing. Um, if you want to hear from Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, you absolutely can. She was not censured. Um, you know, she hasn't lost any of her First Amendment rights. She can go to any of these other uh, websites out there. She can send emails. 
And frankly, I think one of the really uh, immediate ramifications is that uh, she's going to cash in on a little bit of martyrdom. Um, she's going to be telling a lot of conservatives that you know she has been suppressed and that, that she is the victim here. That's an in-kind contribution. The other thing is um, perhaps we'll see a similar effect to uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene that we've seen from the, the former president. He has, uh, believe it or not, uh, actually benefited from not being able to weigh in constantly on every little thing the Biden administration does. So um, is this the end of the world? No. Uh, is it, um, you know, could some of the, the implications and, and ramifications from this decision, um, you know, have, have significant ripple effects? Sure. But uh, I don't think anyone's First Amendment um, rights have been violated by a private company. And Julia, if this continues to go down this track, and, and if you look at uh, if you look at Twitter's description of what counts as misinformation, you know anything that questions, you know, the public pronouncements about about the changing public pronouncements about COVID, if it continues down this road, and you eventually have kind of a a liberal Twitter, and then other platforms that develop for conservatives, do you think there's a chance that 10, 15 years from now we'll look Wolf back at the earlier days of Twitter when everybody was on there and uh, together fighting it out as sort of like a, gold, a, a golden age, almost like the, when everybody would sit around and watch Walter, Walter Cronkite, the way that people kind of uh, you know, have nostalgia for that period. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, Ryan. When you were describing that, I sort of had this picture in my head of what cable news looks like in the United States, or maybe um, in, you know, for example, Great Britain, what the papers look like. You know, you read and listen to what you want to hear. Um, you know, if you're a conservative, you want to watch more right leaning. Um, cable news networks or read right-leaning papers. If you're a liberal, um, you want to uh, get left-leaning content. And I think we could potentially see this happen with social media, especially if you have figures like Marjorie Taylor Greene and Donald Trump really trying to bring their followers and their bases over to these alternate platforms. Look, uh, when Twitter was created in the mid-2000s, it was absolutely created to be a public square for um, ideas from both sides of the political spectrums, all ideas to kind of flow together for people to hash it out in a public square. But I think it's just become so divisive and Twitter itself has gotten involved um, in the divisiveness in this and that you're seeing both sides kind of um, continue to appeal to their base, whether it's, you know, on Twitter or on these other alter alternate platforms. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see if social media goes the way of cable news. And that I think you see President Trump very much tapping into that sentiment with trying to start his own media company, for example. Yeah. Uh, Phil, you know, I, I think she's obviously said a lot of things about the coronavirus that I think are wrong, but some of the things I think are in the, the realm of certainly many of them legitimate debate about the pandemic, about mitigation strategies, and, you know, the, the, the actual health officials, you know, they get stuff wrong all the time. They get criticized, and now we're saying what criticizing the health officials is. Uh, so it seems, I think, um, being unevenly enforced or, or a difficult thing to fairly enforce and that it's not being fairly enforced. That said, I, I like and agree with the point you just made that, you know, it, for all the complaints about Twitter being biased against the right or against Republicans, um, keeping the crazy Republicans off the platform so that they can't say embarrassing things that make them look bad is actually itself possibly you could see as a as a right a contribution a a benefit for the Republican Party in general, um, which is kind of funny. Yeah, and where this gets more dicey though is when you actually have government and then these already biased tech organizations. Uh, working together. Earlier in the year, we saw the Surgeon General come out and say that uh, misinformation about coronavirus was a public health emergency. And uh, that's interesting because then when you have big tech and government sort of working together to decide what is and isn't disinformation, you know, that, that's kind of alarming um, because certainly uh, the, the question is what, what what definition of, of misinformation are you going to use? How is this going to be applied? Um, you know, how are you going to, you know, actually make certain that you're not just using this as another cudgel to keep your, your opponents quiet? I, I think something that we should recognize when it comes to the conversation about coronavirus is 
um, on different fronts. Uh, you know, that there are varying degrees of, of debate and agreement. I mean, for instance, um, in the last couple of, of weeks, we've seen uh, both the left and the right sort of agree that, you know, when it comes to, to cloth masks, you know, one might be more effective than the other, that, you know, the, the vaccinated can actually end up um, getting and spreading the virus. Um, you know, that, that many people are entering the hospital uh, with COVID, but not from COVID. These are things that, you know, if you would, would have rewound the clock, and you would have said those perhaps sometime in 2020, that would have been much more controversial than now. But that's not because facts change. It's because, you know, we, we know more um, about uh, this virus. We, we know more um, about how it, it works. And so if, you know, at one moment in time, you define anything as, as misinformation based off of a, a current set of facts and those facts change, mm -hmm. and, and then it becomes a much more difficult um, right. difficult pro process to say, you know, you, you are spreading misinformation versus you aren't. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that becomes a moment where people have a lot of egg on their face. And if I could add on to something Philip just said, um, I, I think it's been crazy over the holiday break or over the holidays. I've been seeing people on the left and the right, perhaps for the first time really during the pandemic, seemingly somewhat unite over their frustrations with the CDC, particularly this five day quarantine period. I mean, you have people on the left or people who have been a bit more um, strict with coronavirus restrictions saying, well, five days isn't enough. How do we go from 10 to five days? People on the right, obviously saying the CV CDC has been changing its guidelines. It's too hard to follow, you know, to believe what what they people should follow. So I, you know, it's interesting to see how that's all played out on social media. Media. I'm not saying the left mm -hmm. and the right are united on this issue, but I think you're starting to see on a lot of these platforms from a, more of a frustration from both sides of the political aisle against public right. health officials because everything's just constantly changing with how to yeah. react to the pandemic. Yeah, I saw a public health official tweet um, over the weekend that, you know, if we do X, Y, and Z, we can control this pandemic. And I'm like, well, that's misinformation because we clearly <laughs> cannot. Um, anyway, Phil and Julia, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. And stick around because we will have more rising right after this. <laughs> 